Okay, we're all set. So let's uh, go ahead and open up in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. And Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of my sisters in Christ coming together and studying your word. Lord, I pray that you will guide us and direct us in all truth. I pray, Lord, that you will remind us that you are sovereignly in control of everything, regardless what we see going on all around us. Lord, we trust you and you alone for the outcome with everything. And as far as being able to fix everything that's going on, Lord, this has been so corrupt for so long that uh, I believe that you're just using the reality of the situation to bring about your will in your perfect timing, Lord, and that includes your return. So I pray you will continue to help us to prepare for your return and help us to pray for one another and encourage one another in the days ahead, keeping our eyes on you and not focusing on everything that's going on around us. It's only going to be a distraction to continuing on in our walk with you, which is going to be critically important in the days ahead, Lord. So please keep us grounded in your truth. Keep us faithful to the end, Lord, and may your will be done. And we look forward to your return, Lord, whenever it's going to be. Um, you already know what's ahead. You know every little detail. So we do not trust man. We do not trust politicians, government, or any organization in this world, because every bit of it's corrupted by sin. So please, Lord, draw us closer to you each and every day. And we thank you for this. We love you, Lord, and we pray this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, today we're going to spend a little time in the Old Testament. And what we're going to prepare for here is what is leading up to the events that take place in Genesis 11, which is the building of the Tower of Babel and what was going to be the building of the city of Babylon. So it's going to give us some good insight as to, now that we've covered the overview of it, give us insight as to how did all this come about and what was the outcome of it, short term and long term, which will then be leading us next week into a look at the empire of Babylon, which was that second Babylon that we mentioned in our study on Tuesday. So this will give us, um, like I say, some background information that'll be helpful. And we will see the sequence of events clearly laid out in chapter 11 of Genesis, which is the beginning of this whole thing regarding Babylon and the worship of idols, the worship of false gods, and the decision of man to act independently of God. Up to this point, that's been done on an individual basis going all the way back to Lucifer and even Adam and Eve. They've all made a decision to rebel against God's authority. But now it's taking a turn and now groups of people are coming together as mankind without the Lord 
And everything regarding Babel and everything regarding regarding paganism and the worship of all these false gods has got its origins all the way back to this point in time, which basically was the time that followed the flood and the destruction of the world. So that's why we're going to start with a couple of key points from the flood and the story of Noah. We we're not gonna we're gonna save the details of that for a whole nother study. We're just gonna cover some of the key points that leads up to this event in chapter eleven. The long and short of it is we're gonna continue to see from this point now in the old testament as well as the New Testament, that the spirit of Babylon has never left. The rebellious nature of man has never ended. And even though we have come to saving faith and repented, we still battle with the flesh and our sin nature every single day. So the reality of that still exists. But for those that are in open rebellion against the holy God, it goes much further than that. By not lifting up the true God and worshiping the true God, we end up directly or directly worshiping the enemy himself. Any worship of any idol and any false god is a direct attack on the holy God, the creator of all, himself. And the reason why Satan ends up with all the glory for it in the end, temporarily, is because he's the one that is working behind the scenes as all these things are happening and the more that man promotes self and they promote their own will and their own agenda and who they will serve and who they won't serve this ends up fulfilling the agenda of the enemy we may think that we're operating as a separate entity, but we're not a separate entity. We cannot sustain ourselves apart from the Lord. So that leaves good represented by our Lord and evil represented by Lucifer or Satan. One of those two, Jesus taught, is our Father. It's either God himself or Jesus referred to the people that disobeyed and rebelled against the holy God. He referred to them as individuals whose father is Satan himself. Because there is no middle ground. It's the Lord's way or it's the enemy's way. It's good or it's evil. It's heaven or it's hell. There is no middle ground. And we are swayed and influenced by one or the other. Either we will respond in obedience and follow the true God and yield our lives and obey and abide or we will be in pursuit of the things of this world and the gods, small g, of this world, which are all there to promote self and individualism and rebellion against the true God so that these individuals can live 
their own life the way they want to live it. That's pride. That's arrogance. That's rebellion. And that has been around since the very beginning. And it will be around to the very end. And that is the reason why we're spending this time on Babylon. Because it's not something that's come and gone. And as the end shows us in the book of Revelation 17 and 18, it's spiritual Babylon that is the concern. It's not just about the city located in modern day Iraq. It's the spirit behind it. Because it represents the rebellion of the enemy himself. It represents the direction that the majority of men and women in this world are heading. And it's not just those people that deny the existence of God and live a godless life. There's church-going people that follow God up to a certain point, which is usually just church attendance, and maybe once in a while something else. But when it comes to denying themselves, laying down their life, and actually following Jesus, that's a whole different thing. That's more than they want to do. They don't want to deny themselves of anything. And their own pride of life insists on them being on the throne of their own life. Which is why man often tries to go his or her own way. And they will only cry out to the Lord when they need something or when they want something. It's not to acknowledge their sin. It's not to repent of it. It's just to make their life easier. It's to give them a blessing for their rebellion. How ridiculous is that? We have the audacity of going to the same God that we're rebelling against. It doesn't work that way. And that is why in our day, now that things are really starting to heat up, and now that man is coming together for their own purposes, which is also the purposes of the enemy, we're going to be seeing things happening just like we already are that we have never seen in our lifetime. And it all flows from that same rebellion, that same godless spirit. Because we've got the majority of 8 billion people trying to be their own gods. That's where all of that is going to lead. A unity of mankind without a holy God guiding and directing them in holiness is going to lead to the end of all things. And that's why we see that final Babylon, spiritual Babylon, known as Babylon the Great in Revelation 17. That's Satan's empire.
and that's the last world empire on this planet. Each day that we see the unification of mankind combined with the rejection of God, the rejection of God's will, and the rejection of God's word, what we're witnessing is that final apostate church coming into existence. That will be the final world religion. The Antichrist will be at the head of it. Satan will receive all the glory for it. He is the one that has all the power behind it. But it's going to be very similar to what we're going to see with the Tower of Babel in that the true God is cast aside. It's mankind doing what they want. Of course, what they don't realize is whatever they're doing is still in accordance with God's will because God is still sovereign. There is nothing that no man, no woman, nor the enemy can do that God is not master of and ultimately in control of. And that should comfort us. If he allows it to happen, it's only because it needs to happen. And it brings us one step closer to the end of all things. And the Lord will conquer. See, we already know how the story ends. God is victorious. Jesus Christ has redeemed the elect of God. And the elect of God will spend all eternity in the presence of God and Jesus. While all those who have rebelled against him for a lifetime will still be alive for eternity, but in the lake of fire, eternal judgment and torment, which they will not just ever escape. That's how it ends. And the more we see happening in our world today, which is unprecedented, it should be opening all of our eyes to the realities that our Lord is returning soon. No one knows the day or the hour. But he's given us the signs to look for. And we're getting awfully close. The enemy thinks he's going to be victorious. But God has already shown us that it's God who's going to be victorious, not the enemy. And those that are playing around with God and attending their church are doing bare minimum of whatever it's going to take to escape the lake of fire. They will continue to try to do, but it's futile because the Lord knows their heart. They're not coming to the Lord because they know the Lord and they love the Lord and they want to reconcile with him and through the cross of Christ to make things right with him. That's not what they're attempting to do because they have no intention of yielding their life. 
They have no intention of abiding in him and walking with him faithfully to the end. All they've come to recognize is that there is a coming wrath and judgment of God. Scripture is very clear about that. And if they don't do something about it, they're going to face that wrath and judgment. So what they're trying to do is they're at the bargaining table now trying to buy a fire insurance policy so they don't end up in the lake of fire, but stopping short of any commitment and any love for the Lord himself. They're not broken or repentant over anything. They just don't want to be tormented for all eternity. Well, they can do and say whatever they want externally, but God knows the heart of every single individual. And those that are just trying to escape judgment, God is not blind. He's not deaf. He's not indifferent. Those people whose hearts are already hardened belong to their father, the devil. But they're certainly not children of God. All the way in the beginning of Genesis, you can see those two sides already formed, good and evil. And all the way at the end of book, the book of Revelation, you see the same two sides. Only you see that the victory is God's. And everything in between is a transition of the world. Generation after generation after generation to go from the original Babel which represents rebellion against a holy God to the final great Babylon. That is the one world religious system that unifies mankind, all in rebellion against the true God, so that they may worship a false God. that accepts and receives all these different religions, all these different gods. I don't want to oversimplify it, but I do want you to see that through what we've already covered up to this point, that's exactly what we've seen going on from beginning to end. So the more we see man unifying and coming together and religions of the world moving closer and closer and compromising the truth that they may come together. While the true God, Jesus Christ and his word People are turning their backs on and committing apostasy and turning away from the truth at the same time they're unifying. That's what's going to bring about that final world system. It'll be man's the fulfillment of man's desire to live their life independently of the Holy God. And yet, while they're trying to escape the wrath and the judgment of God, they never will be able to. God knows man's heart. 
He knows man's heart. And there's a special place waiting for them that much of the world denies that it even exists. That's exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. So with that said, let's look at scripture together. The first part, like I say, I'm only gonna, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. We're just gonna pull out some key points along the way. Referring to the preparation for the flood and the flood itself, which will then bring us to Genesis chapter 11, which will be our main focus for the rest of our time. So please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And let's take a look at some things together here. First, let's take a look at verse 3. Genesis chapter 6, verse Three, And we can hear from the Lord himself what the Lord is observing in the world and what he intends to do about it. Here's what verse 3 says. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. For that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. But here's what the Lord is saying in this one verse. First of all, this is only the beginning of the sixth chapter of Genesis, and God is already grieved at what is going on in the world that he has created. Man is rebelling left and right against a holy God. The first murder has already been committed. Cain killed Abel. And the Lord said that the blood of Abel was crying out to him from the ground. And what was Cain's response to that? Am I my brother's keeper? As if to say he knew nothing and he had nothing to do with it. But God knew the reality. Cain killed Abel out of jealousy. So it didn't take long. We already had rebellion with their parents, Adam and Eve, who didn't want to come under the authority of God. Now the first murder had taken place. And things only got worse and worse and worse until we get to a point that God says that he shall not always strive with man. God is warning of something that's coming. And what was coming was a worldwide flood. And this worldwide flood was judgment that was coming down upon this earth for all the evil and all the rebellion. That man had committed. When the Lord says. 
His days shall be 120 years. What the Lord is saying is 120 years from today, a flood will come and it will destroy the entire, the entire world. And what are those 120 years going to be used for? Noah, who started by himself. Noah was going to build an ark. And on that ark were going to go the animals that he spared. And mankind that was declared righteous in the eyes of God and who the Lord extended grace to. We've mentioned before that that number of people was eight. Eight. The population of the world at this particular time, estimates is all we have, obviously. And estimates run from the hundreds of thousands into the millions. So let's say it was only 100,000, which is really an underestimation. But let's say that's all there was in the world. Only eight of the 100,000 were spared. If that population was in the millions, the percentage of those who were spared by God is far less. And that has always been the way. If you were to ask people, especially in the United States, everyone's a Christian. At least in name. But those that are actually saved will also represent a very, very small percentage. And that's certainly what we're going to see here. So 120 years from the time of God making this statement, the flood is going to come and destroy the earth and everyone in it, except for those that are on that ark. Let's take a look at verse 5 to see another thing that angers the Lord. Verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now one would have to question, how much evil could there be? When at this time, There were no like major, major cities. Roads were not invented yet. Cars were not invented yet. No telephones, no smartphones, no television. So one would wonder how much trouble can you get into? Well, there's still murder, there's still theft, there's still idolatry, and on and on it goes. But in contrast, you could see that if the Lord was grieved and angry because the wickedness of man was great all throughout the earth, and that on his heart were thoughts of evil constantly, that's all they thought about was sin and rebellion. 
How much more so in our day? where every city here is like Sodom and Gomorrah. Where there's gambling, there's prostitution, there's drinking, there's drugs all over the place, even drugs that'll kill you. We've got every modern convenience available, which these people didn't even have. And look at the evil that we're generating. The greatest export of the United States is pornography. That's something to be proud of. The more the Lord has blessed us, the more the evil that is on our minds and hearts have thoroughly corrupted his world and mankind. So if the Lord was this angry and upset thousands of years ago in the days of Noah, how much more so today? And if they had a problem with every imagination of their thoughts, of their heart being evil continually, what do we think it is today? If what is existing is not evil enough, give it a few days and someone will come up with something else that is even more corrupt and more evil. Like with all the human trafficking we're doing. That's big business, especially for children. It makes us wonder why the Lord hasn't already brought an end to all this. Well, there is a reason for that. Because the Lord has an established plan and purpose. And the timing of all of it has already been ordained and decreed. It will happen. But it will happen according to his will and his timing. And no one else's. It's coming. And I think that we can agree with the things that we have already seen just over the last three years. That we have reached new heights of evil. And we're just getting started. It's doubtful that the evil in the days of these men and women of Noah's days was anywhere near as evil as our generation. And yet, their generation was the one that was completely wiped out, except for eight people. You can imagine the disaster and the judgment that is coming upon this world. And that's not far off. There is no thought of God whatsoever on the part of mankind. They were probably into all kinds of idolatry, even at this point before the flood, since evil was on their heart continually. So in verse 7, God comes to a conclusion and he says this. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, 
both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But there's one exception. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was far from perfect. Noah was far from sinless. But he had a heart for the Lord. And he was obedient to the Lord. And we know by Abraham and Moses and David and others. That if the faith of a man or a woman was such that. They had a desire. To walk with the Lord and be with the Lord and be obedient to the Lord. The Lord credited it to them as righteousness. Even though no man is righteous, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is imputed to the sons and daughters of the Father, they are declared righteous in his sight. By faith. And that's what Noah had. And he found grace in the eyes of God because of it. Let's drop down to verse 11. And we can see what's going on in the world a little bit more specifically. Verse 11 says... The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The heart of man being completely consumed by evil continually. Showed the evidence of that. Through filling the earth with violence. Again, comparatively speaking, I'm sure that the violence of that day was significant. But look at the violence of our day. We should know better, shouldn't we? All these generations before us, don't you think that should have taught us something? Instead of allowing the Lord to teach us through it, we've taken everything we've learned and now we've used that for evil too. And we've come up with guns and an arsenal of weapons that outguns most police departments. And gangbangers and drug dealers use it willfully, not caring if they hit an innocent child or anyone else for that matter. I'm sure the Lord is absolutely right that the days were filled with violence. But I look at the violence of our day and say, if that again is not pointing to the final judgment, and the wrath of God being poured out, I don't know what would. We hear about it every single day. Every single day. Verse 12, God says, God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. All flesh. 
The reason why God says all flesh is because Romans chapter 3 says, there is no one who is righteous, no, not one. That's a fact. So in verse 13, God says to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, not to take away anything from the significance of the flood that destroyed the earth previously. Regarding God's final judgment, where his wrath is poured out, he says that nothing like it has ever happened in the world before, nor will it again. So as bad as the flood was, with three different groupings of judgment coming down in the sealed judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bold judgments, it will destroy the heavens and the earth and everyone on it. That's what's coming. So after warning Noah that he was going to destroy the earth, this is where he gives Noah the command to make an ark. He gave him the exact dimensions. And he gave everything in cubits. So let me translate that for you, what that means in feet. The ship would have looked more like a barge. Or the, the ark would have looked more like a barge than any other kind of ship. It would have been, according to the dimensions, 450 feet long. 450 feet long. That is one and a half football fields. It would have been 75 feet wide. 75 feet. And 45 feet tall. It had three decks. And the total square feet that would have been available for Noah to use was about 95,700 square feet. More than enough for two of each animal, male and female. And when it came to the birds, which were used for offerings on the altar there were seven obviously most of the ark would have been animals because it only had to accommodate eight people When the scriptures talk about the building of the, of the ark, it also talked about the fact that Noah covered the inside and the outside of the ark with pitch, which is another 
reference to like a tar substance. To seal it like a water, water seal so that the boat would not leak. God told him everything. He gave him all the dimensions. But there was no one to help Noah. So initially he did the building until his sons were old enough to help. The world certainly wasn't helping Noah because every day that Noah was building, he's bearing testimony and warning to the judgment that is coming. And of course, that kind of thing goes in man's ear and right out the other. They didn't help one bit, nor would one expect them to. But they didn't even believe him when he spoke of judgment. Just like the majority of people today don't believe that there is coming a final judgment as shown to us in the book of Revelation. They deny that. They deny it's going to be as bad as it says. Well, I'm sure that the people that were on the earth did the exact same thing. First of all, they're laughing at Noah because in the middle of the desert or the middle of the wilderness, he's got this humongous boat that he's building. And there's not even a puddle of water to put it in. But God knew exactly what was coming. Noah didn't just talk about being faithful. Noah was faithful. Because in spite of all the mockery, Noah did exactly what the Lord asked him to do. No questions asked. He didn't question like, why would you have me build this thing? In no man's land here. Shouldn't we put this in some water? He didn't question God. Because he knew God was sovereign. And he knew that God knew what he was doing. God. Through Noah would bring about the destruction of the earth and everyone in it. But the faithfulness of God really stands out in a message like this. Because we would be ready to crush our enemies, mankind, in particular, for all of their rebellion. But God instead used Noah to continue to warn them, giving them 120 years to repent. Could you imagine? 120 years to repent. And you know what the result of those 120, 120 years was? Not one single soul, other than the original eight, repented. Not one. I can assure you, that at the final judgment, it's going to be the exact same. Man's going to be so far from God, and their hearts are going to be so hardened that they will have nothing to do with him. And no matter how much time the Lord gives us, which, by the way, so far is 2,000 years and counting. Whew. 
proves his faithfulness to us, even though we are so unfaithful to him. He didn't have to give them any warning. But he did so out of his grace and mercy. The next thing I want to show us is following the filling of the ark. For the Lord brought the animals that needed to go on that ark. And God again warned him that soon that rain was going to start and it would continue for 40 days and 40 nights. So Noah faithfully had prepared everything on the ark, including enough food to feed the animals and themselves for this whole time period that they would be on the ark, which was actually longer than the 40 days and 40 nights because it rained for 40 days and 40 nights but the waters had to recede before Adam, uh, I'm sorry, Noah and his family could get off the ark. And that they could let the animals go as well. So they went in, the animals went in, and so did the insects and everything else, two by two, male and female. And Noah, at this point in time, believe it or not, was 600 years old. One thing that we can clearly see regarding the ages of man is that pre-flood, man lived a lot longer. After the flood, there were things to contend with like mold and other things that led to infections and diseases and started, started to shorten man's lifespan. But at the time that the animals were going on the ark, Noah was already 600 years old. One more key thing I want us to see in this part of the story is please take a look with me to at verse 16 of Genesis 6. Verse 16 says, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. That's very, very significant. The door would have been on the side of the ship, about in the middle. So it was kind of a ramp going in. All of that would have been covered in pitch as a water sealant. God was not only observing to make sure that everything was being done the way he had commanded, and it was, but God took the final step to secure man. And he did it by closing the door 
himself. Noah didn't close the door. Neither did his sons. God the Father closed the door of the ark and sealed it by sealing it to provide the final protection so nothing comes in and nothing gets out. The ark is a picture of Christ. The elect are a picture of Noah's family who were called and chosen by God as his elect, who he will save and secure and seal in order to keep them and protect them to the very end of all things. This is why every son and daughter of the living God is filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in the temple of God, which now dwells within man. And they're brought to Christ. And they're in Christ. And the Holy Spirit seals every son and daughter. So that no matter what they face, they're sealed and protected. And they belong to God for all eternity. The ark is a picture of Jesus. And it's a work of the Trinity to save, to secure, and to seal every son and daughter of the living God throughout the generations. God knows every one of them by name. And while, because of thousands of years, it's going to be a large sum of people, on a percentage basis, it'll be a very small percent that are saved. Because the majority of the world is in rebellion against the Holy God. God covered every detail including sealing Noah's family. So none of the people that were on the outside trying to get in could get in. And so Noah and his family were protected and safe in that shelter that God provided them. Just like we are safe and secure in the shelter that the Lord has provided us in Jesus Christ. It's the Lord himself. Now, a couple of things I'd like to make mention regarding the flood itself. Starting in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 7, it says, And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and they bore up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. So, what would have happened as, as the waters came? It didn't inundate the ark. It lifted the ark. And the ark rested upon the water. And it wasn't just raining 
her 40 days and 40 nights. All the underground springs also pushed up water from the ground. There was water everywhere. So you got rain coming down for 40 days and 40 nights, and you've got all the underground springs spouting up water at the exact same time. Not only was the earth covered in water, But take a look at me with me in verse 20 of chapter 7, and here's what it says. 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. How much water came down? To find the highest mountain. And according to the Lord, the highest mountain was covered beyond its top with 15 cubits of water, which is 22 and a half feet. Now, if there was any way that somehow someone would have survived outside of the ark up to this point, then imagine the highest peak because all the mountains were covered. But imagine going to the highest peak and looking up. Because from the top of the highest peak, there was another 22 and a half feet of water. Almost the size of three men on top of one another. No one survived the flood. Except for the eight that God extended his grace to. Everyone else died. Every other animal died except for the ones that were in the ark. Now let me mention one more thing that is often overlooked. Because I still see questions on this from time to time regarding the judgment. Does God allow children to be a part of the judgment? The answer is yes. Because if you look back at the days of Noah, it was not just young adults or middle-aged adults. Noah himself was over 600 years old. There were old people there, middle-aged people, young people, teenagers, student age people, and even infants. And since none of those people were part of the eight, none of them were part of the eight, every single one of them died. including the children. So here's the question that rises up, and this is where some people ask this question. 
Does that mean that those children are in hell? And I can't answer that. Because God is the judge. But God being a gracious God, I am sure that if there was a child who had done no wrong, that the Lord would take that into account. But then again, there is not a single man or woman born into this world that is not born into this sin nature that every single one of us carry. And on top of that sin nature, we commit our own sin. I can't answer that question directly, but I can tell you this. God is holy. God is righteous. And God will do what is right. But this is the reality. However many people were in this world, only eight adults were on that boat. Noah, his three sons, and all four of their wives. No mention of children. No mention of babies. Now, if the Lord had declared those babies justified in his sight, they wouldn't have drowned. The ones that were drowned were unrighteous. Or would God still have, by his grace and mercy, saved them? All I can say is that God, being a holy God, will always do what is right. But I cannot speak on his behalf with that. Because I don't know for a fact. If they were declared righteous and given the grace of God, like Noah did, then they would have, those children would have been on the ark. But if they drowned with the rest of the world and there were no survivors, then we're relying solely on the grace and mercy of God regarding their souls. But I can't decide that for him. He's the judge. And he is the judge for every single one of us as well. But it's a sobering thought, isn't it? And where do you draw the line? Infants up to what age? Because doesn't it vary regarding how each person is wired up? And whether or not they commit sin willfully. Do we include students in elementary school? We know we certainly can't count adults into that. But those are all questions we can't answer.
but it should open our eyes. And it should open our eyes to the reality that even if the Lord were to spare those innocent children, if he declares them innocent, he didn't spare them from the flood. They still face judgment, right? Coming the final judgment. It'll be even worse. God is holy. God is righteous. God will do what is right. In his own eyes. But fact of the matter is, up to the point of the rain and the underground water pouring out. There would have been young children. And there were very old people. But Noah must have been in great shape because 600 years old and he's building an ark of this size. Must have been in great shape. We can't question God's holiness. We cannot question his righteousness. We may not understand. And in this case, we may not know. But Jesus didn't, or God didn't even spare his own son. Because without his own son going to the cross on our behalf, we would be going to the cross and then spending an eternity apart from God. His own son was not exempt. But this would have included people from all age groups. That's how serious this is. When God issues a warning, we had better heed the warning. One more point, and then we'll stop for today. And we'll pick up on this next week. Because we didn't even get to a chapter 11 yet. But one more thing I want you to see. Starting in verse 23. I'm sorry, starting in verse 21 and going to verse 24. We'll close out chapter 7 with this. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of the beast, 
and of every creeping thing that crept upon the earth. And every man, every man, that means no survivors. How could there be? 22 and a half feet higher than the top of the highest mountain? There were no survivors. Verse 22, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Eight survivors, plus the animals on the boat. That's it. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. That means the rains and the underground springs poured out water 40 days and 40 nights, and it took an additional 150 days. For the waters to recede so that Noah and his family, any animals, can get off the ark. That means that they were on that ark for 190 days. And the Lord had provided enough food and water for Noah and his family and for the animals. What a faithful God. Well, when we get together next week, we'll take a look at a couple of points regarding after they were finally able to get off of the ark. And then the rest of our time is going to focus on chapter 11 of Genesis. That'll be on Tuesday of next week, where we can see the beginnings of Babel. But I just want you to know ahead of time that if Babel began, from the descendants of Noah. And by the time we see them in Genesis 11, they are already fully compromised. They are already completely into paganism. They are already worshiping false gods and completely ignoring the true God. That tells us very, very clearly that it didn't take long for man to go back to rebelling against the holy God and the creator of all. We'll take a look at that next week. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word and truth, Lord, and I thank you for these sobering reminders that you give us. But when it comes to judgment, all will experience it, except for your elect, the ones that you have chosen. And I believe that those that are present today are yours. 
It doesn't mean that they will live a problem-free life because we do live in a sin-filled world and sin still dwells within us. But through Jesus Christ, we will not face the judgment, the white throne judgment. And Lord, we can only thank you for that. It's only by your grace and mercy. But Lord, it should open our eyes to the countless people that are around us that whether it's by choice or not, are completely clueless regarding what we're talking about and regarding what has happened and what is going to happen soon. May those that you have chosen to have mercy on, in fact, be extended mercy, Lord. May you protect them and keep them faithful to you to the very end. Thank you for this time together, Lord. We love you, and we pray this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today. And... I pray and hope that you have a great rest of your week and 